And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers here in the temple. We have the we have the man taking over all of your anime un under a pair of star-shaped sunglasses, and the mo and the mo and arguably the most plus ultra man in the temple, good brother Shades. And on the other, and on the other hand, we have the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadara Enterprises, currently currently funding its mech division, and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. There are too many good robots. We need good pilots. Come and see if you're a good guinea. Pi I mean, pilot today. <laughs> I told you. I told you not to use not to use that not to use that gimp suit shit from G Gundam. We are not using any mobile trace systems. That is a trademarked uh, product. Instead, we are using something else. We haven't named it yet. Um, that's going through the marketing department. Why'd you hire Tombstone? Mm. Shits and giggles. Because yeah, he is the marketing department. Exactly. <laughs> but... This is this is a rare case because usually I like to separate the different genres that we ta that we tackle on these things, but for this one because of the way the scheduling was going to work, if I did if I shifted this around, it, I wouldn't have been able to get to it this year, and there's and there's the fact that the timing just seemed right. Because, lady, oh, eh, depending on who you ask, they will tell you that the that the art of Japanese tokusats. And uh, and other forms of of fan bases that we will get to, is serious business. Those people are sometimes right, but more often than not wrong. And this week we're going to be delving into that in what I call tokusatsu and the seriousness fallacy. A serious business, guys. A super serial. So. I suppose I should get. I suppose I should go into a bit on on when this dawned on me. I um I've been watching through Common Rider Revice, and I've generally been enjoying it. And I made a comment. Uh, I made a comment elsewhere that I like Revice, but I have a strong feeling it's going to be divisive. Hashtag nice vice. <laughs> <laughs> and I joined that hashtag. The reason the reason why I say that is because. A lot of a lot of people got it got into got into Common Rider in, in general and Japanese to uh, Common Rider specifically and Japanese Tokusatsu specifically in the er, in the um, early to mid two thousands was the especially in, especially in the really early really early days of um, TV Nihon and in a lot of case in a lot of cases because of because of the trends that were going on where things were going for a far darker tone. A lot of people had the idea that that was the <laughs> default. I like it. I liken it to remember, remember in the early two thousands when, um, at, when um, a lot of people were a lot of people were overcompensating on insisting that anime isn't kid stuff because of the, uh, because of the animation is kid stuff stereotype that had been prevalent throughout what throughout Western culture for decades. Yeah, I even mean, I was even part of that kind of thing. I remember telling myself, these people don't matter, because I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. And then I'd promptly shut the threads and keep watching anime. I I'll be honest, I trolled around uh, an slash A a lot, looking for recommendations rather than engaging with anybody, because engaging with slash A is fucking poison. <laughs> well, it's fucking 4chan, what do you expect? I just... <laughs> First off, TG is the best forum. Second off, um, no, you are wrong. Slash M. Where only the manliest of men mount their mechanical friends. Phrasing. Phrasing. I know what I said. <laughs> but let's consider. Let's consider for a moment what a lot of people's first introduction to. Um, common writer was. 
I think I started hearing about a lot of people coming in around Fize. Yeah, that's... Fize and Blade, I think, were the big, the two first big ones. And both of this, and that is squarely within the, within, within, I'd say within the Inoue era. Fize, absolutely, yeah. Fize was just totally Inoue's work. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, don't, and don't make, I don't want to sound like I'm slagging on Fize. There's a lot of stuff I like in Fize. However, both of, however, both of those, both, um, Fize and Blade have a significant, have a significant lack of levity. Yeah, they, they're, yeah. they're mostly darker, more serious, um, with maybe some light patches here and there. Uh, as a, as a comparison to another more serious series, um, that still has good levity, I present my still favorite modern series, uh, Gaim. Um, Gaim starts out with a little bit of levity, but there's darkness intertwined, especially with the whole, uh, what happened to the old leader of the Gaim, of, of you know, the Gaim troop, and, yeah. you know, you, there's, you get, it's funny, at least around Kota, but other stuff is, it's there in the background, and then it, it does go into some pretty dark shit by the end. I, I'd also throw out, of course, my personal favorite series, Double. I mean, yeah, on the one hand, you've got the dark... It starts off on a dark note with the death of Sokichi Narumi, Shotaro just losing his mind, you know, getting dragged into this war. But then you turn around in that same episode, you have Akiko coming in and evicting them for stupid shit and just goofing around like an idiot and doesn't have no idea what the fuck's going on. Mm -hmm. Or... You know, whacking people with her freaking cr green croc, and all, the and Shotaro constantly screaming like a madman whenever shit go, whenever shit goes tits up. <laughs> you know, like I, like I said, local detective screams at everything. <laughs> yes, you know, they're, they're, you know, I, I have to be Thanos here, because if there's one thing I've always said, a good series has balance. Yes, you can have the dark, mature, even sometimes gritty moments in a series but you have to have those moments of levity to balance that out or else it's going to be too much and one of the complaints often levied at Fies is that it is way too fucking dark and that what moments of levity does have often come off as insulting I mean poor Fies himself you know he can't handle hot stuff and the co and they constantly basically throw hot food in his face more bullying than actually funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that. Thank you. That's a perfect way to put it. Of course, of course. When it comes to when it comes to dark and fies, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, asshole. Sorry, Kusaka. Kusaka <laughs> who um, is a is is a fucking asshole in in the canon and got worse in the novelizations. <laughs> and then, of course, with a uh, with with Reiwa series. Um, Zero One tried to strike that balance. Uh, we saw it tried to reach it. It got really heavy near the end, like really heavy. Oh yeah. Um, but that's also kind of a a, um, a result of the particular theme they were going for. The technological singularity is never looked at with levity by anyone who knows what the technological singular singularity could entail. Including yeah. in real life, many many uh, theoretical scientists do not like the idea of technological singularity for the particular threat it could cause at an exigent and existential level for all of humanity. And exploring that while also trying to keep things upbeat, um, they did a very good job. And then the Izu episode happened. <sighs> and then we get arc one. Yeah, that little too far in the wrong direction there. Mm -hmm. It made sense within the story, though. I'm going to be honest. Made sense within the story, but unfortunately, that was the biggest kick in the dick I think I've seen in modern Common Rider. The, yeah. Um, the... I'd say I'd say the 
if I were to if I were to summarize um zero one if I were to summarize zero one the same way I summarize W same way I summarize double, it is I can't I'm I'm not joking when I say this I'd say the gr the great tragedy of zero one is that the writers were too good at their job. Yeah, and and that's considering the fact that they also had zero one's writing and development. Did take a bit of a sh take a bit of a hit because the pandemic struck right in the middle of their season. They, so the fact that managed they even pull that out of their ass throughout all that is actually impressive. Yeah, and after way too long, I finally did see the zero one movie that was meant to fo that was meant to follow up, and I I did enjoy it. Um, the others movies I didn't enjoy as much, largely because. In the same way, in the same way, I'm still kind of iffy about Rebellion. It was a case of a follow up that I'm not sure was necessary. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's an obligation because they always have to have those V cinemas afterwards. Yeah, but be, I, I guess the reason I'm I'm jumping around these points and we are too ultimately is these are all examples in one form or another, of both good and bad, very serious moments within Common Writer. And most of the series we've named, besides Double, are the darker, more serious tones. Um, which is, again, why Revice is now being used as the complete foil. For a while... For a wa now, for a while, the foil was Den-O. God, Den-O is... <laughs> Deno, Deno, <laughs> you can't take Deno seriously. I'm sorry. No, you, you know, it is absolutely designed to be a comedy series. And take away the mo the, the later movies and all of the subsequent reappearances when they seriously did not need to be involved. The main series is actually really good. Like yes. it's my our buddy Easy Rider. It's his personal favorite season. The but problem, the problem was it Deno way overstayed its welcome. It did. And then ended up swinging the pendulum in the opposite direction too far. Mm -hmm. It was too silly. It was, it had very, you know, it tried to have some serious moments. You know, Sakurai's story, I think, pretty much exemplifies that idea. Mm -hmm. But even then, it never took itself, it, it, even that never took itself too seriously. And the, the comedy just completely drowned it out. Would you say would you say that it's that it suffered from a Japanese strain of Whedonism? I, I can kind of go with that, yeah. Oh, but for the for the record, make sure make sure make sure that you make sure that any time anytime you're around Joss Whedon, um, wear a mask. Not yeah. because not because you want to slow the spread because but because you want to not because you want to not be not because of the pandemic but because you want to slow the spread of Whedon's disease on your writing buddies. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, th that's the thing about this is that you know because a lot of these fans came in seeing the darker side of Common Rider with F Fies, Blade, and later Kabuto, that was their that that was the impression they got that that's what Common Rider was this dark, gritty, serious superhero series, as opposed to what we were seeing with Power Rangers at the time. Yeah. And they decided to take like you said earlier, they decided to make that the default. Like, oh, that's what Common Rider always is, right? No, because even during the older days, a lot of the series out there were not that serious. I mean, stronger, stronger. Anybody? Come on, That's common writer, stronger. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I mean, stronger is a good example. Actually, a stronger is a very good example of striking that balance because it was a series that I mean, you look at his fucking design for fuck's sake. <laughs> That's, That's, what, That's why I said stronger. But at the same time, it had its dark moments. I mean, that tackle anybody? Yeah. <laughs> like you can't you can't laugh at that. It, no, that was taken that was handled with all the seriousness it needed to have. So it was a series that struck that balance. It could be serious, but it was also very silly. And even shows like Black now, Black is probably an example of a series that would probably fit in that dark era of Heisei, because it was fucking dark. Black and Black RX, yeah. Got to consider Black RX both. to a lesser extent. Black RX tried to try to swing the balance back, and it it kind of worked, but then when it got silly, it got really dumb. Mm -hmm. 
Uh-huh. Like the the fro the the banana the the monkey monster uh, mutant. Just who remember, could create folks, a key out of it. Just remember, folks, everything is Golgum's fault. Golgum. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and of course, Black Arx also had one of the worst villain factions in all of Common Rider. Period. Mm-hmm. Which is sad and, because Black deserved way more than that. No, oh, but yeah, Black. De- yeah, Kotaro definitely deserved better. Well, I don't know about yeah. But, no. Since you mentioned since you mentioned Black and Black RX, this would be a good this would be as good a time as any to address the elephant in the room, because if we want if we want to talk about going too going too far on the serious end of the spectrum, um, let's talk about the Dark Age and why it happened. Ah uh, yes yes, the last three films that Shotaro Ishinomori put together, and the first of them was an attempt to try to uh, market Kamen Rider to an older audience. And thus we had Shin Kamen Rider. Please stop. <laughs> I thought Please Z- stop. I thought Zeto this hurts. <laughs> hey, Zan, grip it and rip it. <laughs> grip it and rip it. Shin I don't like it any more than you do. Shin but we got to talk about it. Shin is incredibly divisive. On one hand, there are some people who say who say it went say that going in going into a going into the archetypes of a monster movie was a bridge too far. While others say, while others say that it was closer to the original designs of um, of she, of Shotaro Ishinomori's work, and to play devil's advocate on that, a lot of his work does have a, has always had a bit of a horror element to it. Even the original yeah, and- Common Rider did, and of course there's cer- there's certainly a horror element when it comes to, when it came to some of his some of his uh, some of his other works, especially stuff like Gilgamesh or um, the Skull Man. Yeah, the the original Skull Man was a very dark series. It mm-hmm. was too dark, in fact, <laughs> because it was you know it didn't have a happy ending. It di- it was very much showing. It was designed to show how revenge is not a pursuit worth having. Mm-hmm. That was the whole point. Was the main character the, the Skull Man himself was so, so caught up in revenge that he was blinded to the truth and. It was only once he realized it that he sacrificed himself so that the madness would finally end for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, yeah, it's a very dark series, which is why when it was remade by one of uh, Ishinomori's understudies, the newer Skull Man ended up being a little more balanced. And that's what led to the creation of Kamen Rider. Yeah. Although, I would, br- I would bring up the, the, um, the Skull, the Skull Man anime that Bones did, which, has the same problems that I see that I see a lot in Bones' work. See, here's the problem with that. That Skull Man was actually more tied to Cyborg 009 than it was to the actual Skull Man. At least it was trying to do that. It seemed it that seemed to be the in, that seemed to be the intent, but there was never any um, follow through on that concept. No, I get the feeling it didn't do very well, so that's probably why. Because yeah, the the whole intent was that he was supposed to become uh, Black Skull. I believe was the name from the villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the whole that was the whole thing with that movie is it was supposed to lead to that. Which, when you compare Black Skull and the actual Zero Zero Nine manga to the Black Skull at the end to the Skull Man in that movie, um, uh, not really much similarity here. No, I think I think at I think at one point in one spinoff there was there was the implication that Black Skull was Joe Shimamura's father, and <laughs> that didn't go anywhere. Thank God. Yeah, but yeah, getting back on topic here before we go too far off the rails here. But yeah, like that's the thing. Like Ishinomori has always had his has is admittedly I think that would be one of his faults is that he does take things way too seriously. But that's also why he wasn't the one. He wasn't the only person at the helm of most Common Rider series. He had a team that helped him balance shit out. Mm-hmm. And he and he actually understood the need for that. Yeah. <laughs> He couldn't Ishinomori- do it himself, but he understood that that was something that needed to happen, especially for a TV series. Yeah, Ish- Ishinomori was actually pretty genius with that. Um, and if we're going to be fair, it, it, like true fairness, we go back to Common Rider 1. And like you said, it was where you strike the balance with the, the horror elements and the darkness and some of the levity. The actual original Common Rider is still... it's it. It has the... 
the seriousness that you might expect from most, you know, 80s sh- or 70s shows, I mean, excuse me. <laughs> um, but it also has the same type of comedy you'd expect from the 70s as well. <laughs> and let us, uh, let us not forget that literally it has birthed a, a, an icon for the ages. Hiroshi Fujioka, uh, we love you. You are a treasure. Um, please continue to live. <laughs> and I, as an aside, I do appreciate that he is tr- that he is training his son to be essentially the next common writer. Yeah, I'm glad his son wants to be because he, you know, you know, he wouldn't force it on his son. Yeah. No. Not, he, not only that, would be this, but be the successor to, um, se- to Sega to Sanshiro. <laughs> Sega ta Sanshiro Sega ta Sanshiro Sega ta Sanshiro And if that doesn't revive your childhood for some of you out there listening you're heartless and I pity you <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of a zen on that one I mean, if you weren't old enough to get it look it up on YouTube, trust me you will not be disappointed the man is a character in Project Crosszone and Project Crosszone 2 for a reason. Bon Presto, now Bandai Spirits, saw, yeah, Take- Takeshi Hongo, Sagata Sanchiro, Sagata Sanchiro, let's go for it. He's a judo master, let's do it! And uh, Ben <laughs> made him a unit you can use. Yeah. Now, the. When it, now, of co- now, of course, there were two. Uh, there were two others, Zeto and um, Jay. Jay is meh. Um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Ev- I'm pretty sure everybody. Everybody at Super I looked at Jay and was like, "Rookie." Yeah. Uh poor Yuta Yuta Mochizuki. He deserved better. <laughs> and Z- I'd say I'd say Zeto is the is the best of the three. And de- and yeah. definitely has the vibe of a of a origin story kind of kind of setup. Even though it even though it is it is seri- even though it is on the serious end, it doesn't go too far into that. No, it doesn't really have much levity to it. But it did have it did make sure not to go too so dark that it needed that levity. It usually just kind of stayed at a pretty good pace mm-hmm. throughout. That be now. And of course, the the director of that would also do Mechanical Violator Hakaider, which is also really, really good. Um, but the reason wh- but I brought th- I bring these three up to illustrate the re- the supposed reason why this came to be. There was a com- there was a comedian who did a, who did a character sketch called Kamen no Rida that was meant to parody Kamen Rider. And it did such, di- and it did it did massive amounts of damage to the point th- to the point that it wasn't until 2000 where the idea of even trying to take it to take a s- stab at Common Rider was considered. Oh, I'll, I'll do you one better on that. The damage, no, it didn't stop after 2000. It has continued to this day because many of the people at Toei have forgotten how the original Showa era was in terms of Common Rider. And it looked, and it basically looked at Kamen no Rida as what it was. That it was silly, it was goofy, it was not, it was not, it never took itself seriously. Meanwhile, the whole premise of you know of Kamen Rider was actually had a dark undertone, and an android who a, a cyborg escaping an evil organization and fighting back against them, and hell, V three. You cannot tell me that shit didn't get dark. <laughs> uh, but the and, and this culminated in you know one of the absolute worst Common Rider movies of all time, Common Rider Tyson. I think that is the p- epitome of how much damage that parody did. Mm-hmm. And yet they they not only have moved on from it, they've even acknowledged it as Common Rider appeared in. Uh, uh, hey, say generations forever, mm-hmm. and also appeared later in Zero Over Quartzer. Oh no, I think that no, I think it was Zero Over Quartzer. I was thinking of. 
Uh, my bad. It was zero over Quartzer. Um, yeah. But yeah, he he makes an appearance in zero over Quartzer, which considering they were bringing out every like non-canon writer out there and all the ones that hadn't made an appearance on video yet. Yeah, that makes sense. They brought in the <laughs> like, brought in the fucking manga version of Kuga and tried to I was going to say manga. So yeah, but th the the thing is is that even in the Heisei era, there were shows that struck that balance. I mean, hell, the original Kuga had really good moments of levity. You know, even Agito, and, and well, I don't want to say Ryuki because Ryuki was shit all around, as uh, past episodes of this uh, little podcast of ours has proven. <laughs> we don't but, talk yeah. about Ryuki in this house. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. We've already it's done all I'm leaving it at that, my friend. I am agreeing with you. Yeah. Yeah. But over time, I think even Toei started to realize that they were going too far in the dark direction. Deno was an overcorrection, for to be sure, mm -hmm. but... Decade or no, Kiva started trying to bounce back from that, and it carried on through decade, and then they finally hit the sweet spot with double. Yeah, and they've tried to keep it at around that level since. Some a little more lighthearted than others, but there has always been that sense of balance between all the seasons. I mean, O's was very lighthearted, but had a dark undertone. Forze was Forze. nothing but lighthearted, with with the dark undertone kind of missing Gentaro. Yeah, that man could not be brought down by darkness. No, he everyone could not. Is it was everybody friend. else. It, 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 he was such a bright light that he was literally bringing everyone else out of the darkness, which was kind of the motif of that season. Mm -hmm. Everyone, do it with me now. Chest bump, chest bump, <laughs> and now we want a handshake. <laughs> yeah, <there> you, <laughs> you know, I used to hate on Forze a lot, especially after the ending. That ending was pissed me the fuck off. I've lightened up on it since, especially in the light of other series that have honestly been worse. And see, I. I never hated Forze Shades. I I love I, Gentaro. That man is awesome. And I just I love the idea hate, of I, that's, that's the thing. I shouldn't hate Forze. It's written by one to, uh, like not one of my favorite Toku writers, Riku Sanjo, and one of the writers behind freaking Gurren the God. That should be a that should be a freaking Reese's cup peanut butter cup for me. <laughs> <laughs> um when it comes but, to, when it comes to those two writers involved, it was it's I, I think it, I think it was a case of who's getting coffee, and I think Sanjo yeah. had said that it's that it that he was that he was playing second fiddle at that point. Yeah, he was admittedly, but still, like point still stands. Those two guys working together, that should be a Reese's peanut butter cup for me. That's a fucking good combination, but it just didn't click. I they just didn't gel as well together, and there were some problems. There were some issues, I will say, with Forza, but it's not. I no longer consider it a bad season. I, that belongs I, to Ghost. <laughs> I consider Ghost an unfortunate season, but not exactly bad. Um, I would say that when it comes to Neo, to, to the second half of Heisei, Neo Heisei as some call it. Yeah, um, I, the term. And I just, as I got, I got to use both. Um, but the, 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 the second half of Heisei, uh, I, I've watched all of these. I'm sure we all have. Um, Pretty much. And the only one I can consider actually disappointing, and that's because of the unnecessary amounts of extra shit it got after the fact, was Zio. Yeah. I, I, like, yeah, I can... Zio, I mean, it makes sense. Anniversary season, they had to go all out with it. But I do agree with you that it wasn't perfect. Though I still say, if you compare the two, I'll take Zio over Decade. When you talk about strictly anniversary celebrational series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Decade was snake bitten from the inside, so that's not really its fault. It, no, but it's not. It's not. I, it, I'm not going to point blame fingers here. We're, we've done that already. We've yeah. Again, previous mm -hmm. episode. Mm -hmm. But... In terms of what we actually got, Zio at least felt like they were able to work with what they had. Yep. It wasn't perfect. It had plenty of faults. We had complaints during when we were, when we riffed it, but we at the end, I didn't feel disappointed about Zio. Underwhelmed, possibly. I would definitely say underwhelmed. I think I was already expecting issues. Like even when this first got announced and I heard was who was involved, I was I set my expectations low. Because you had the unholy combination of, of the of of Mr. Shirakura, 
<laughs> and and his and his per, and his person and his personal um whip and his personal whipping boy. Who's um? Why is it? Why is know, his right? Escaping. Why is his name escaping me right now? <laughs> Um, a lot of people, a lot of people first knew him because he was the he was first off. He always ends up appearing second whenever, whenever Shirakura shows up. Yeah. But he, but uh, here, his big uh, here we go. Name. Naomi, Te it was Naomi, Naomi Takebe was the other producer, but it was oh no, it was uh there were the three writers involved with Gio. I think the one we're looking at the two names we're looking at there was actually two of Shirakura's butt monkeys on this one. Mm -hmm. Hento Shimayama. And Nobuhiro Mori. Shimoyama is the one that I'm aiming at. Yeah, she, because Mori has had some good stuff to worst, it. Um, for one of the worst Sentai we had we had seen in the last few years. Oh yes. Don't worry. And as far and for Nin Ninja and Leftovers, don't worry. Your day will come. <laughs> oh, we will get to you soon. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did, was that another reconstruction I hear? It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be in a while because I had to have to force myself to rewatch all of Nin Ninja. <laughs> don't do that, Monk. Please well, don't. Well, we we need you to live. Well, one of you is gonna have to find a video that truncates the experience. Otherwise, yeah, because uh, now that this shit does not do his reviews anymore, he's not doing it, and Blinkara doesn't do history of Super Sentai, so that's out. Mm -hmm. Uh. And I don't even think Mar even Marcus Satsu, who I'm not a big fan of, I don't even think he's done a, a, a history of Sentai on that one yet. Well, he's mainly stuck to Common Rider. Yeah, maybe, maybe for maybe for the best, depending depending on how you want to look at it. But the point the point is, if I can't if I can't if I can't find a summary, and the and reading the wiki isn't going to cut it, um, that means I that means I got to take matters into my own hands. <laughs> Yeah, good, good luck with that. Lord, uh, knows I'd, Lord knows I'd need it, but... <laughs> I never want to watch it again, Monk. I never want to watch it again. I'm That's saying real. something. I'm even willing to watch fucking... Uh, I'm, I'm going to hate myself for saying this. I'm even willing to watch Ryuki again. I am not willing to watch Ninja again. You're, I'm right with you on that one, Zan. I am absolutely with you. Oh. Which, incident... Incidentally, when it comes, I should note when it comes to Zio, we missed a golden opportunity. We missed a golden opportunity when it came when it came to not when it came to Knight meeting up with um, of Gates. You know, because the two of them look so similar to each other. <laughs> yes, yeah. If you, if you take uh, how Knight looks back in the actual series and compare him to Gates, how how Gates looks in this one. Uh, yeah, that was freaking. It was like one for one. But I haven't, I haven't actually, you know, I just, they were father and son. <laughs> there you go. Actually, you know what? Speaking of Geo, hmm. actually, that's a good. That's a good another point we can use to kind of help exemplify our point here. Yeah. Because Geo, actually, Geo is one of those shows that tried to have the balance, but actually couldn't pull it off. There was actually a bit of a disconnect at times where it was silly when Between. it didn't need to be and serious when it didn't need to be. Yeah. I'd say a, I'd say a lot of that is due to. I'd say a lot of that is due to the fact that Geo and Dec Geo and Decade um, suffer the same problem in d in different ways. The f whether it whether it be the whole destroyer of worlds thing or the or the or the ruler of time who ha who ha who has ar who has already wrecked the, who has already wrecked the world fifty years from now. The the fact of the matter the fact of the matter is you have th you have um you have everything building up to a certain mystery i'd almost i'd almost compare it to a gynax ending and yeah. much like a gynax ending with all with all that built with all that build up and all those moving parts trying to coalesce into into this one point you end up you end up having the expectation set far too high to a level that it can't to a level that it can't possibly match yeah, though I will give Geo the, the the credit where it's due. It made an a, a honest to god effort to try to reach that level of epicness. Like it had, I think the problem was is that it it was it rushed that la that last bit. 
you know, killing off Chase and then Gates and then everybody else to finally cause Sogo to go Omegio. You know, it was all like, it was all so fast. And then at the same time, they're introducing, they're finally showing, oh, Sukiyomi's a writer too. And now she's getting killed off. The story like, that I all heard of that is happening that, at once. The story that I heard is that they is that behind the scenes they couldn't figure out they couldn't na- they couldn't um, agree on a design for Sukiyomi, which is why it took so long. I would have said if it took that long for them to come up with a design, you'd have been better off just scrapping it all together. Like if if you had to wait till the last episode to introduce Sukiyomi, you'd have been better off scrapping it and having her be a movie exclusive. You actually might you actually might have got gotten away with a lot more just putting just putting that as exclusive to a v cinema yeah i mean you could you you could have still done all the v cinemas and everything like that and also uh lady k's back here she just brought up like you know basically we're saying yeah they should have done what decade did <laughs> with kivala the only difference is sukiyomi would have still gotten more more love because she would have been used more that and i'm is- sorry no that geo decade crossover does not fucking count <laughs> Now, when it now when it comes to getting getting bringing things back to that to that particular um, seriousness thing, a lot of a lot of people one for one for, I I I get the feeling that when it comes to the way the way people treat seriousness with common writer nowadays, I think a lot I think a lot of people are overcompensating for the downward spiral that happened with Deno, to the point where any bit of levity ends up. Um, conjuring those kind of memories, and they over and they swing the pendulum too far the other way. Yeah, it, it's definitely something that er- everyone's panicking because yeah, you start adding levity. There. Oh god, they're gonna make it like Deno again. No, no, stop. That's not what's gonna happen. Trust me. Even you know, yeah, they overuse Deno way too much. They've learned their lesson. I hope. <laughs> and to be and to be honest, when it comes to comedic over when it comes to comedic overuse, um, as far as who's on the top of that per. As far as who's on the top of that perch of just comedic abuse, Deno is off, Deno's off the list in my in my opinion. He's off he's off the top of it. The per, the 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 real king, the real king of this abuse, especially when it came to how it was done in camera work, oddly enough, is Ghost. <laughs> yeah, it was try it, it like it had a, such a serious premise. A guy literally dies and becomes a ghostly common writer. There was no darkness. There was like no maturity to it whatsoever, and they did not take it seriously at all, and in all the worst ways. Like they didn't even take the whole thirteen icon thing seriously because they freaking ditched it within their first third of the series. The other, the other, the other big problem for me, and I, this is the reason why I bring the why I bring up cinematography and these kind of things is. You have so many scenes of just trying to do rapid fire jokes with rapid fire camera shots. In the same, in the to in the in the manner I in the manner I'd expect a a um, Looney Tunes short to be done. Yeah, th- th- there there was a lot of it. Also, didn't help that there were a lot the, the a lot of the side cast was just simply comedic foil. You know, as like well, as well as the worst fucking monk I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> including him, yes, absolutely. He brings shame him. to the rest of us. <laughs> uh, M- M- Mildred, it sounds to me like you got a personal vendetta against Amori. He's a mo- he's a monk who make he's a monk who makes the rest of us look like idiots. Why do you? <laughs> of course, I have a fucking grudge against him. He's in the book. <laughs> look like. <laughs> look like monk. Only look like. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> do I need to hit the button again? I think you do. Alright. Yeah, this one's for you, Zan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're dubbing that Xanatrix's personal theme song. <laughs> It's too bad I already have a theme song, isn't it? Yeah, maybe elsewhere, but here, that's your theme song. Do not associate me with the Gullwings. 
Oh, we totally are now. <laughs> but don't don't get penisy. <laughs> Same to you. <laughs> moving on. Moving moving on before we end up talking about orbital frame pilots. <laughs> Oh. What are you talking about? There's only one orbital frame pilot. Moving on! Mm-hmm. His name is Diego. Yeah. But when it comes I did when it comes to when it comes to this bit of this bit of seriousness, this is I'd say I'd I'd say that um that pursuit of this of this mythical serious nature is what re- is what resulted in the rise and fall of Amazons. Now, yes, yeah. the went yes, uh, it was it was meant to it was meant to be a means to try and get more Japanese eyes onto Amazon Prime Video, but I remember Shirakura do, doing this whole thing of remember when Kamen Rider had teeth, which I thought was a very poor choice of words, and I want to and I, we've said this in the past. Season one of Amazons was really good. Season two of Amazons. Was definitely more a Shirakura thing. Oh, I, yeah. It, it, it's fingerprints all over it. And I didn't see the movie, so I can't comment on that. But it's but it's the but I get the feeling that those fingerprints wouldn't be there if there wasn't this pursuit of a mythical seriousness, and that's kind of what I want to get at. That um, that try that trying to pursue this. That whenever people try and pursue this kind of seriousness, they end up pursuing a idea of it rather than an imp- rather than an actual execution of it. Because we brought up we brought up stuff like du- we brought up stuff like double in the in the past. I do not think I do not think double was trying to be a, was, I don't think double was trying to be a more serious take on the on the on what was on the trends of the Heisei era. It was just no. it was just trying to reconstruct reconstruct from all of the from all of the distance, and I think I think Riku Sanjo outright said as much. Yeah, oh yeah, he was trying to bring Kamen Rider back to the roots, and he, he understood what those roots actually were, and su- that's why it succeeded. Now, here's the thing: the problem that I, the thing that you have to understand is there's a difference between being serious and being mature. And I think that's where a lot of fans are getting misconstrued and where they're getting thrown off. Mm -hmm. You can have a show be mature. And in fact, being mature comes with some silliness. It comes with that levity. That's part of the maturity of it. There's a, um, a lot of people, a lot of people misunderstand the term comic relief. Cause, because for the, for the longest time, comic relief has been a shorthand for annoying side character. Your 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 maters, your your Olafs, all that all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The key with the with the idea of comic relief is in the word relief. If tension if tension in a story is akin to stretching a rubber band, the the relief is to is to ease that is to ease that back so that that rubber band doesn't snap. Yeah. If done properly, comic relief can be a perfect balance for things. Mm-hmm. This is why you had people like Akiko in Double. She was a comic relief character. Yes, she was annoying at first, but even she had her moments of seriousness and maturity. more And more so maturity mm-hmm. as the series went on. And though while she was still silly from time to time, she matured like everybody else. And thus that comedy ended up being more natural. There's also the fact. There's also the fact that it's a rare case of somebody who was annoying at first and getting a reason you suck speech. Yeah, and that, that episode of the mansion. Perp, that was that was such a good episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to to add on about the differences between maturity and seriousness, um, I would say the seriousness fallacy ties into uh, another theme we've explored before, <clears throat> which is how things you as you said there needs to be some silliness in becoming an adult and the seriousness fallacy ties into the misguided notion of what it means to be adult um uh, one of our favorite quotes monk from c.s lewis Mm -hmm. 
to be concerned about being grown up, to admire the grown up because it is grown up, to blush at the suspicion of being childish, these are the marks of childhood and adolescence. Um, and he, he ends it using uh, part of a quote from the Bible, along with a little bit of an addition to it. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. The seriousness fallacy, I feel, ties into that idea that people think tokusatsu has to be all seriousness for it to appeal to people who are adult. Yep. And I, I could not dis- I could not agree with that more if I tried. <laughs> yeah. And I th- I think it I think it's very telling that whenever whenever someone tries to whenever whenever someone tries to do a mo- to do a more ser- to do a more serious take, um it always it always ends up descending into a farce. Um now one now given that I brought up Amazon's one one might ask if I if I'm going if I'm going to be doing a reconstruction on that and the answer is no. Um, large, largely because, largely because I think there's too many moving parts for me to do that, and there's also the fact that Amazon, it, Amazon's was a very, a very character-centric kind of a kind of affair, even more so than some of the stuff we've tackled beforehand. Yeah, trying to break all that down would be insane to try to do, because we'd have to break down every single character, at least especially the at least the main the main three. Mm-hmm. And a couple of the other side characters, that'd be way too much. Yeah. It certainly it certainly works for what it for what it wants to do, season two notwithstanding. But it is it is one of those things where we'd have when we do reconstructions, we tend to go with a broad brush approach. We would not be able to do that with Amazons. No. Now but when it but when it comes to when it comes to bouncing around with with seriousness or not, that's a perfect segue to go into the unique relationship that Super Sentai has had with seriousness over the last few years. I.e., this is as good a time as any to talk about what Des Shinta has called the Car Ranger effect. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> now, this stems from another misconstru- uh, misconstru- uh, misconstrued idea that... Car Ranger supposedly saves Super Sentai, and thus a lot of executives of Toei use Car Ranger as a template for future Sentai seasons. Let's go ahead and nip that right in the bud right now, ladies and gentlemen. That fall- that is another fallacy in and of itself, because anyone who knows anything about Sentai's history knows that did not happen. Car Ranger did not save Sentai. It didn't completely destroy it or hurt it. It did okay, but it did not completely it save it. That belongs to Jetman. Mm -hmm. But the thing with Sentai is, is that once again, that whole, that people are, people treat, Car Ranger is to Sentai what Deno is to Kamen Rider. It is a series that when people see silly moments in Sentai, they fear it's going to be another Car Ranger and they panic Mm -hmm. because it, if it gets too silly, they don't like it. Now, if it gets too silly, you get Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, to be fair, they have a little more validity to the argument here. But, that's because Sentai, by its very design, can't be serious. Not to, not to, the, same, not to the same level, at least. I'm pre- I, haven't been able to find su- I haven't been able to find subs of it, but even the, even the original Go Ranger, what you'd be hard-pressed to call all that serious. Yeah, it was goofy as shit. One of their ultimate attacks is a five-colored uh, football. <laughs> football with fins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you can't take that seriously. Now, that's not to say there haven't been seasons that have been taken seriously. Live Band would probably be a grand example of that. Mm-hmm. But that that is the exception that proves the rule. Because very few seasons, you know, there, there was a kind of a dark area, a dark t- a period of Sentai during that time. From Live Band to, I want to say, Jet Band would probably be the end of it. Mm-hmm. You know, but Zoo Ranger kind of started pulling that back, mainly because, once again, Shirakura. Shirakura has this mentality of, it is a kid's show. And I mean that in the bad way. 
We need to make this as as childish as possible so it appeals to children. The funny thing, yes. what I find fun, what I will always find funny about Zoo Ranger is that despite it being despite it being the basis for Power Rangers, I would sooner watch Power I would sooner watch season 1 of Power Rangers than watch Zoo Ranger again. Yeah. Because the the story of Zoo Ranger just gets completely silly and bored and almost nonsensical at times. Like, they literally contradict themselves and pl- and create massive plot holes because, oh, we just wanted to pour on another... Like, with Zoo Ranger, I will set out say it. Shira Kura handled uh, Zoo Ranger like he was Vince Russo. Swerves for the sake of swerves. Also, wait, also, wait, also putting way too much focus on the kid side characters. Oh yeah, that that's a Shirakura staple right there. Mm-hmm. If 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 there if if, if Shirakura is involved directly, there is a ninety nine point nine 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 percent chance there will be a a little kid involved that ends up being the centerpiece of the whole thing. Again, hi, Common Rider Tyson. How the fuck you doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, and I can I can under I can understand that to to some extent. Although, I'd argue I'd argue the I argue the when it comes when it comes to how to use when it comes to how to use a quote unquote kid character right, oddly enough, I always con- I always end up finding myself come back to Hibiki. Hibiki is a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, even Easy will vouch for a series that he normally does not care for, but uh, Ghost Sager. Not a great series, but their child their one child character, Asamu, actually was a good one. There's, but there's been the, there's been this whole, but the reason why I did the whole bouncing around when it came to serious and silly with Super Sentai and and um, the whole Car Ranger effect is this mindset that, well, the last if if a season does poorly, well, the the mindset at Toei is, well, it didn't do that well because 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 it was too se- it was too serious for kids. So they, so they go the complete opposite route. Um, I'd say if I were to use a recent example, even though. It's uh, even though it ha- even though its motif is something I should have been I should have been all in on. Um, Ryu Soldier. Yeah, I mean Ryu Soldier wasn't super serious. It was actually very lighthearted, but eh, it didn't quite cl- it didn't quite click. But they took the same art. They took that argument, and the next season got even sillier. Though again, the only and one and here's the problem. Whenever they do start doing a silly series, they always hand it to somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing, so they think it works. Because Go Busters, a, ser- a, a somewhat more serious season, didn't do too well, so they went with a more silly aspect for um. Uh, fuck, I forgot the name already. <laughs> Let but the next see. season, they went with a more silly season, but they put it in the hands of Riku fucking Sancho, mm-hmm. and so, of course, it did oh, gangbusters, because the guy does fuck Kyo Yuger. Yeah, Kyo Yuger, you know, was a little bit sillier, a little more lighthearted, but they gave it to Riku Sancho, who knows what the fuck he's doing, so, of course, it was well-written and well-made, so, of course, it succeeded. Yeah, and for whatever reason, decided, oh, hey, got, hey Sancho, I know, I know you're not that good with large cast, but we need you to do a 10-member series. <laughs> yeah, well, not not as not as great as work by any means, but it's still pretty solid. Mm-hmm. And then again, and then you know we bring up Ryu Soldier. Same thing happened there. Ryu Soldier was a mi- mi- mediocre, bl- low, below average season, so they went even sillier, and they gave it to Naruhisa Arakawa. <laughs> yeah, the guy who the guy who basically who who basically wrote the book on how to on how to write a season for for about a decade. <laughs> like the guy who has made pretty much every good, every highly regarded Sentai season ever since like the mid, like the late nineties. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in fact, when in fact when I found out that he was coming back, I I ended I ended up making I ended up making a bit of a Thanos joke. You could not live with your failure, and where did that lead you? Back to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and of course. That did freaking Kara Major did awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't perfect. It had a few nitpicks here and there, but 
It was an overall fun series. Yeah. And with and um now with it's de- it it definitely it seems it seems it's um now when it comes to Go Busters, I will it I will play a little bit of Devil's Advocate. Some of the reasons why it didn't do as well were due to factors outside their control, namely the namely the Fukushima incident. Not a good idea to ha- not a good idea to to do a st- to do a story about 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 en- about forms of energy when there when there is a react when there's a major reactor incident. Yeah, they kind of got they kind of got they kind of accidentally put themselves into a corner on that one. Mm-hmm. It was unavoidable. I mean, they couldn't they couldn't even write their way out of it because it the the whole Eneton Eneton thing was the entire centerpiece of the season. It was the entire motif. They could not write it out. Yeah. <laughs> which is so, why, they, <laughs> which is why I say they got kind of, they got screwed over by just ridiculously bad timing. Yeah. Now, but the the point at the end still stands. Mm-hmm. Now, with um with the with, I would act when it comes to Ryu Soldier, I would actually argue that that was a silly series that should have been ta- that should have been taken seriously. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It, it it was like I said, it was it was lighthearted. It was very lighthearted. I mean, it was very much trying to rip off, ri- uh, uh, take cues from Kyo Yuger in a lot of ways, but. It, it it tried to walk that balancing line, but it just didn't quite nail the landing on that. Mm-hmm. Now, with how Zenkaiger has tur- has turned out thus far, thus far, it seems that it seems that they're starting to they're starting to get a handle on the on the on the type of silly. But even even before that, let's 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 not let's not pretend that the that a lot of a lot of people seem to pretend that the silliness thing is a new factor. When it it really isn't. One of the one of the big examples I, I always come to is how absolutely goddamn weird Jiraiya was, especially when you compare it to the rest of the Metal Hero series. <laughs> but no <the> Hayate. <laughs> Two words sums it up perfectly. Really? And even, and, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say really when it comes to most of Tokusats. Um, one, the the only one I can think of that takes itself more seriously more often than not is, of course, our our, uh, our favorite dark horse, Garo. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but Due to that its was also nature. by design. Mm-hmm. Whereas every but... everything else, everything else I see in Toku, um, th- this fallacy will always apply. Yes. Yeah. E- even even in kaiju. It, even if we go back to the original Godzilla, there is not a single person that can tell me, looking at the original Godzilla movie, that this series started out super serial. Because, fuck you, that shit was goofy as fuck, and we loved it. Yeah. And, and you know, we're getting back on the Metal Hero train for a minute here. Yeah. The original Kavan was somewhat serious, but even then, Kavan had its silly moments, and <laughs> other Metal Hero series do as well. For example, we're actually right in the middle of, of riffing uh, Just Beyond. Mm-hmm. My god, that series is goofy as shit! <laughs> oh. Holy shit, that series can get silly at times. I mean, one of the side characters is literally just named Boomerang. Guess what his weapon is? <laughs> it sure it ain't. It sure as ain't fucking... Uh, sure as ain't fucking a, a, a slingshot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, they just literally just called him Boomerang. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow, real original there, Toei. I hope DC <laughs> isn't going to try and sue them. Is that, <laughs> is that almost, as a, almost as silly as a cockroach of the boomerang as a weapon? I don't know. <laughs> Ask Mega Man X1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and there's other series that do the same thing. Like, that's the thing. You, you know, have you know, balance is key. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of. I'm trying to think of any inst- of any moments that Ultraman um went v- went very far into the serious end of things. Oh, Put, oh, we aside, can add to this. Putting aside the Netflix um series, that's oh no no no, not talking the Netflix stuff. That that's cheating. That's cheating there. Oh, a series that is so serious that it wraps around to being goofy. 
Ultra Seven. I could, I could, I could certainly see that. I was, I was tempted to also bring up its um, sequel, Ultra Seven X. Yeah, Ultra Seven X absolutely fits that bill. It is so. It tries to be so fucking serious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, uh, no. I, when it comes to Ultraman, um, the fact that what started out as making an X with his hands has now become an L with his arms. Just for for the spacium beam, because if if you look at old 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 Ultraman, it's crossed at the wrists. But these days, everybody knows it as wrist down at the elbow. Yep, it's changed over the years. And I'm sorry, sure, crossed at the wrists makes it look like you're in a cool pose for a laser that's coming from the edge of your hand, which is silly in and of itself. <clears throat> but with your arm all the way down at your elbow. Making an L with your arms, that's just redonkulous. It does There's, look silly at times. It looks and, fucking ridiculous, and I'm so glad we're getting the, the anime Ultramen as units in Super Robot Wars 30. Absolutely. Now, in terms of the opposite end of the spectrum, really, most Ultramen are super lighthearted. You know, but the later, the more recent Ultramen have also been going down this road of being a little, a lot more lighthearted and silly. Jeed was a perfect example of this, very... Lighthearted, and right now we're currently in the middle of Ultraman Zetto, which does not take itself very seriously <laughs> at all. But at the same time, there have been some series that have tried to be a little darker, or but probably a good one though. I don't think it did very. I don't think it did a good job on that regard. Mm -hmm. I, I, I or didn't click with me as good. But like. That's the point I think we're getting at overall here is that when it comes to Japanese Toku, aside from Garo and maybe some like smaller shows like Garigan, none of these Toku take themselves all that seriously when you really sit back and look at it and do th expect a dark, serious story is just dumb. There's also the there's also the there is also the fact that the oh, the only t the only times I can think of where somebody's done something Toku adjacent that that has gone in the serious route and actually been successful with it is is stuff like the um, stuff like the Boom Studios comics for Power Rangers and I think I think in that I think in that um, in that particular avenue is the best is the best place to go the best place to go with it because it's clearly meant for for older fans. And yeah. Can do but things. even Go ahead. Even in those they always have little snippets at the end. Like they always have like a post uh, a post episode or a post chapter thing where they have a goofy thing with Bulk and Skull or some other people. Like they have this they say them for the very end after the story is done for the episode for the chapter. But they do have them. Hmm. They're there. So you can't even say they don't have uh, silly moments. They're, Bulk and Skull are so iconic as silly characters that their own personal theme is a comedy show. Yeah, and I, any t any time I any time I have to deal with the suffering of my Vikings, I end up hearing that from Tree. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. So I end up hearing that song every week, including this <laughs> week. I'm sure of it. But when, but even even with that, um, whenever it whenever it comes to when it comes to that when it comes to trying to do the serious end of things, um, a lot of a lot of times, the it's very it's very clear to tell people who. Who um are who are in the category of fans who but don't want to admit it or f or were fans at one were fans at one point and are and um are self conscious about it by how they reacted to something that we've talked we talked about about a year ago that being the Power Slash Rangers short film now uh, uh, back to this old this old gem now. I have no interest in dr in dredging up what we talked about when we initially discussed it. We've um, we've beaten that horse thoroughly. What I <laughs> do want to focus on instead is something that we paid lip service to at the time, 
but I want I want to go into that here, and that is how it was. That is how it was reacted, and a lot of people missing the point. Oh yes, Adi I Shankar, remember this. Adi Shankar's intent, as someone who is not a fan of Power Rangers, has no interest in it, was basically trying to parody a lot of fan trailers that were go that were going around at the time of taking something that was silly and turning it ridiculously serious. I'd say I'd say one of the big examples of this kind of thing is There Will Be Brawl, which I actually liked, but the point still stands. As well as well as as well as unfor as well as unfortunate, more serious takes on on sillier things. Um, Shadow the Hedgehog will in will internally be a meme. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I'd I'd be remiss. How the I, edge? I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up Bomberman Act Zero. <laughs> or um, or Final Fight Streetwise, the game that was so bad it's the reason why God Hand got made. <laughs> you watched that episode too, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I just saw it earlier today. <laughs> Matt McMuscles, baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Short version. Shinji Mikami looked at a bit, looked at a build of Final Fight Streetwise, and said it looked like shit. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna make my own version of this just to, just because I'm so pissed off about how this one's looking. <laughs> he became the bender. He created his own version with blackjack and hookers. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> quite literally in both cases. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why do you think I said it, Monk? <laughs> it's too perfect. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. The the problem that happened here is that when this came out, while most of us who were respectable fans, like the good, the, the honest to god fans who were okay with happy with who they were, we looked at we rolled our eyes at the whole thing, and or at least the very least we understood what the point was. A lot of casual fans looked at this as the savior of the franchise. And I, I distinctly remember getting in a long ass argument with Good Brother Nurgle about about it, because he was on the other side of that, and I was I was telling him because I, I did not I did not care for it one bit. I li I likened it to the Fight Club effect, where you had where you had where, where you had people unironically unironically in favor of the of the exact kind of thing that Fight Club was tr was trying to take a shot at. Yeah. It, it, you have to believe Ari Shenkar looked at looked at a lot of that reaction and was going, "You bunch of fucking morons. Thanks for proving my fucking point." I am as someone who is a fan of, of Tokusatsu and and of in the West with the Power Rangers. I took it for what it was. A pretty good piece of cinematography with some nice effects, riffing a war film, and then painting it over with Power Rangers. <laughs> that's what I no, felt when I watched it. You're not wrong. That, that's a perfect analogy, honestly. Yeah. But I... <laughs> and, and so long as I took it at, at, at that value right there, I was like, eh, this is entertaining. I might watch this another time. And I did again, a later, way later, with a friend of mine who had never seen it. But wanting an actual series made from that i was like one that would get real old real quick <sighs> maybe a feature film a feature film based on that idea you could get your own version of power uh sa saving uh power rangers ryan or whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but an actual series even from yeah, god when it came out that was what power slash rangers was that I think was it was that? around 2015, 2016. So Neo Saban then. Oh yeah, it was yeah. definitely Neo Saban. Fuck no. Was... <laughs> Fuck no. It was never going to happen. Well, even never... if... It, one, it was never going to happen. And two... Um... Fuck no. <laughs> yeah. But... Neo, Neo Saban making a war film version of Power Rangers? Fuck no. <laughs> yeah. The only people I could see pulling that off is the is the people who did the Zordon of Eltar fan film. Yeah. Which, which is a good fan film. Yeah, for its budget, it was it was actually it was actually pretty good. Yeah, I saw a couple, I, I saw a bit of that. It was actually pretty good. Yeah, because and that's a that's a good example of, of it. You know, you can take yourself seriously to some extent, but you have to just be. If, if you either have to have some levity or not go that far into the dark and gritty side. Mm -hmm. 
You know, and that's what made Zordon of Altar work. It was serious, but not too super serious. Yeah, it was. It was basically trying to do an alternate origin story, and kind of and kind of dip and kind of and use that to kind of dip into the the um the more esoteric and ends of ends of the of the setting. Um, but I, I think the I think the reason why it annoyed me so much is because I had been down this road before when it came to comic books. Because I, w I was a, I was as much of a survivor of the of the '90s grim and gritty era as you guys were. Yeah, I I I will eternally point to anyone who, uh, not even pointing all the way back to, you know, Silver Age and uh, Adam West Batman, but anytime anyone says. Batman's always been dark and gritty. I point to just two comic panels that were made into a demotivational poster of Batman at Christmas, and this is in one of the 90s or early thousands comics, searching Gotham using a megaphone asking, has anyone seen the Joker? And uh, the demotivational quote is, Batman, world's greatest detective, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, no, fuck you for thinking it. If you thought that Batman was nothing but dark and grim and grimdark, well, first of all, you've been you've been watching way too much old Warhammer 40k stuff. Um, good job uh, avoiding modern Warhammer 40k. Avoiding but, uh, buttermilk, it's, it's... Bob. <laughs> Damn you, Gamza! But uh, that's that's an entirely different uh, entirely different subject. We've already covered that one. Yeah, but. Batman has his serious moments. He's meant to be more, I guess... Noir? Yes, we all know that that Gotham City is supposed to be at New York noir, and Metropolis is supposed to be New York in the daytime. That's, that is supposed to be the comparison. They're essentially the two sides of New York City, the night and the day. Mm -hmm. And... While they're also technically two entirely different cities within the world of of DC Comics, um, it it did lend itself to a more, in in many cases, a darker perspective, just due to the themes of what noir is. But Batman, <clears throat> bat shark repellent, anybody? Yeah. Not just bat, not just bat shark repellent. That's that's an e that's an easy thing to go to go into. But I don't gotta I would, go with the low hanging fruit for the people who don't understand, monk. Sorry. But I would also bring up the fact that th that the whole the whole Batman is dark and serious was roasted over an open flame by Batmite in the Brave and the Bold. <laughs> the Brave and the Bold. Rainbow Batman and a, an entire musical episode with Neil Patrick Harris as the villain. Yeah, oh, good shit. Good shit. Good, good, good times. Good times. Aquaman being Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> and no, uh, for for all of you um, middle aged women out there who are secretly Fujoshis of the West, uh, drooling over the idea of Jason Momoa, that is not the Aquaman we are talking about. No. No. <laughs> We're talking about the old school Aquapan, the blonde haired pretty boy who <laughs> I can talk to the whales. Oh. <laughs> but the th the key th the key thing is is that when um all, a lot of a lot of times whether it be through comics, whether it be through anime, whether it be through Tokusatsu, the question the question always comes down to why it? Why is it that when writers try to pursue the seriousness, or try to art, or try to claim that they're doing a more serious take on a on a character, why they always end up failing? The reason the reason why is, in my opinion, when you tr when you try and ad when you try and advertise about how uh, about how se about how serious you are. You end up you end up over, you end up becoming a farce because if you're sh because the writing will the writing will be sh will be seen as serious or not on its own terms. If you have to tell me that your writing is meant to be taken seriously, then I won't. And a bit of a, a bit of a side tangent on this. 
it's for this reason that I have that I have made very clear over over the last decade. I hold zero respect for quote unquote art games. Whether they whether they be go whether they be anything from the Chinese room like go or or th or things like amnesia or things like the amnesia sequel that I don't like or even or even more recent examples like Life is Strange. I don't like and I don't like any of them because there is because whenever they try to write themselves quote unquote seriously and do a and do a serious artistic story it all you always end up creating more holes than you would have otherwise you guys want to know a serious artistic story and one that i feel still doesn't get enough attention these days uh. violet evergarden ah uh. Yes, I can definitely see that, and I could definitely see you, um, cut you cutting onions in the back dur during a th during a presentation of that anime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh me dude. cut onions? Never. <laughs> I don't need any tools to just look at someone and make them cry, monk. <laughs> My face is ugly enough for that. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna give you that one. <laughs> I was getting, I was gonna say something, but then you brought that up, and I'm like, "All right, there. All right, we're going there." <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I can't laugh at myself, then do I really have a sense of humor? He's got a point. <laughs> Sometimes it's the no. only sense you can make out of life. <laughs> well, you know, the more I, the more I hear, the more we've talked about this, the more I've kind of realized what the real, what one of the big problems is. A lot of people, fans and creators alike seem to have this idealized version of what they want out of a show or out of a medium. And the problem is is that when they when they push for that ideal, not everybody's on board with that same ideal. To mention most ideals can never be matched by reality. They're ideals exactly. that we strive for for a reason. Um, yeah. Do you, did any of you ever did any of you ever read Infinite Crisis or re, or um watch Linkara's review of it? I uh, I've seen the reviews. I've read Infinite Crisis. One of the one of the key things that I that I want to get at is that a theme that it was trying to go with even though it didn't quite succeed because of who the writer was <laughs> was uh, was how, was how chasing after nostalgia can damn you. That was that was one that was one of the that was one of the major themes when it came to super when it came to Superboy Prick. Um, Alex, Alex, and Alexander Luthor's presence in that story. Alexander Luthor was actually a really interesting character in Infinite Crisis. He was. He was. It's just. It's just. Un it's just. Un it's just unfortunate that um, Superboy Prime happened. Yeah, he kind of fucked the whole thing up because if you took Superboy Prime out of that whole thing, both Earth Two Superman and Alexander Luthor. They would have. They alone would have probably made that story really interesting mm -hmm. when you really sat and looked at it. Like they would have been a perfect way to epitomize that. But they had to throw in Superboy Prime because, well, he was there at the end of Crisis, so they kind of had to suit him in. But the way they wrote him just completely damaged the character they had created back then. Yeah. Also, as as my own side tangent and personal pet peeve, uh, DC Comics. Can you not? Can, can can we stop calling everything Infinite Crisis or Crisis on Infinite Earths? Can we can we call it something else sometime, please? Um, there's that nostalgia beta there, and they're trying to ape that, that that zeitgeist that happened with the original Crisis, and well, it it doesn't work. Well, because like going from Crisis on Infinite Earths to Infinite Crisis, people get com confused which one is first and which one is second. Yeah, they they can. It's not that hard. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. But that that's the thing I think we keep seeing is like you know comparing like that we're a lot of people these days are much like Earth Two Superman in Infinite Crisis. They have this ideal of what they want their perfect world to be, but it's a world that cannot exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, incidentally, my favorite line Infinite Infinite in my favorite line in Infinite Crisis is that whole thing of. This world can't be perfect because the perfect world doesn't need Superman. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but 
in that in that same in that same vein. Now, I some of you probably saw the fact that I did amusing just roasting over an open flame the sweet poison that is nostalgia. I don't <laughs> I don't want to reach I don't want to retread that per se, per se, but I want but I want to relay one particular um one particular story. So I I had interest, and then I saw that interest die regarding the upcoming X Men '97, the the, the thing that's supposed to be a follow up to to the '90s X Men cartoon, and the, and then bring and then bringing in a bunch of a bunch of the old um, voice casts to work on it. Well, the ones that they can bring in. Um. But there there were a few things that ki that killed my vibe with it. One of them being the fact that one of the writers. Is suffers from po suffers from political derangement syndrome. The other th the other, but the thing that's more prevalent here was when they announced that they were going to be tackling more adult themes, and I and I followed up with saying, "Congratulations, you missed the point." Yeah. By, by announcing that you're going to be tackling adult themes, first off, it is bad optics to say that because when it because. The, because of the amount of damage that that say South that say South Park and the like have done to the cons South Park Family Guy and even Rick and, and even Rick and Morty and all their imitators have done to the concept of adult cartoon in the West. Like when a lot of people when they think of adult cartoon, they're thinking of the schlocky shit. On yeah. The, on the good side, they might be thinking of some of the better parodies in South Park. On the bad side, they're thinking of shit like Mr. Pickles or 12-Ounce Mouse. <sighs> Both shows I have absolutely zero respect for, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. No. <laughs> the... But the thing... And tr and even even within that, whenever somebody cl whenever somebody talks about the them doing adult themes or mature themes, it always... It always... And it always ends up being a poor... Parody of ma of maturity. If you want, if I need to use a video game example, um, load up the shotguns, boys. We're going cock hunting. Oh Jesus! <laughs> yes, The Last of Us Two. Uh, uh, that, if that is not a perfect example of someone trying to be mature and trying to tell a revenge is wrong story about in in a mature way and ended up being and ended up being a joke. Because of how it was told, I don't know what is. Again, this goes back to this goes back to the argument. One of the other arguments we've been making is that it's less about the story you're trying to tell, and the more the fact that you're trying to advertise the story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. Because let's go back to X Men for a minute. Yeah, one of the big things that the uh, the creators of X Men ninety seven try were trying to do, like we're going to tackle things that are like racism. Uh, you idiots! You didn't have to say that. Anyone who knows X Men knows that's the whole fucking point to begin with. The civil rights movement in general, yeah. It was, yeah. All you had to do was just write a good X Men series. This message will sell itself. <laughs> yeah, and tr the thing, the thing with yes, it is yes. Um, there have there have been al there have been civil rights allegories in X Men since day one. No one, no one's de no one's denying this. But the key word here is allegory and because and people are and people and pe and people of all sorts have taken have taken that allegory and interpreted it in ways that that connects with them that isn't that isn't in the in in the racism bad binary type of type of approach um because i recently i recently watched uh, manga commons review of life is strange 2 and within within that that is an and bring that up because this is another attempt at trying to tackle a serious topic like ri like racism. But the but the way that it the way that it tackles it is is by having by having a bunch of XPs be be cartoonishly racist, and no, with no with no nuance just to beat you over the head of racism bad. Do you get the point yet? Do you get the point yet? Do you get do you get how do you get how subtle and nuanced our point is? Bastard Settle. award winner, ladies and gentlemen. Fuck awards. The point the point that I'm the point that I'm getting at is that because so many people have so many um, writers have tried to do that and then and then get backpats all over the place, 
you have a you have a guilt by association. So when so when so when the writers of X Men ninety seven talk about trying to do adult themes, this is what people are going to think of. This kind this kind of this kind of farcical approach. When in reality, you look we look at look at all the works whose write whose writing has whose writing has held up. None of them ever advertise how serious they are, how mature they are. I'd say the o I'd say the, the only one I can think of that really did that was Spec Ops: The Line, and that and that was simply say, that was simply saying it was a dark and mature story. And truth be told, as much as I like Spec Ops, it has problems in implementation. Yeah. The, the the key to Spec Ops though is that they they said they sold you that, but they didn't tell you how. They didn't make it obvious what they were getting at, and you had to play the game to find out that oh, the big twist. Yeah. I do, and I did. I did do a bit of double checking. There was there was at no point in any any interview on show floors, or 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 for for things like G four or whatever, that they ever mentioned the Willie Pete moment. No. So and, they st they still did they didn't advertise anything and they certainly didn't advertise the whole drugs bad guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And I know some I know some people will br will bring up will bring up some of the some of the, the key the key thing is that is, with this is that if you if you really want to t if you really want to have a serious story, just r just write it. Don't yeah. Don't go don't go about boasting about it because. Everyone, because when you do, when you boast about it, and then you, and then you're so focused on being serious that you d that you forget to actually write a story, and instead write themes, i.e. the, i.e. the, um, i, i, i.e. the, i.e. the, i.e. um, the kind of the kind of shit writing you saw in say Get Out, I fucking hated that movie by the way. <laughs> um, you end you end up being the emperor with his new clothes strutting out in public. Yeah, let me let me give you an example of a good game, a uh, good game that actually did it, and it's an old classic favorite of mine, Undertale. Which will be de will be, de don't go too deep into it because I want to save some of that for later this month. No, 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 I'll, I'll keep this brief. But Toby Fox never talked about what his game was gonna be, like what the th message of the game was because he didn't have to. You played the game, and the message you know was pretty easy to interpret there. Mm -hmm. You know, the what it was told through the gameplay and through the storyline. It was integrated in the the message that he that he likely was trying to tell was blended and integrated into the game, not pasted out in front. The problem with a lot of these creators and and with a lot of fans who keep trying to do this shit is that for them, the message has to supersede the story. And that's where it always fails. I've mentioned this in the past, but one of my favorite movies is Finding Forrester. Oh, a bit of a, a bit of an odd pick for for an for an actor of such pedigree like Sean Connery, but it is, but it is what it is. And there's one there's one there's one scene in particular that I find relevant to to this when he when his character is discussing why he never wrote a second book after getting all these accol after getting all these accolades for writing Avon Landing and he he talks about it in the context of of um when when you fir when you fir the greatest feeling in the world is is reading through your first draft after you finished it before anyone gets their hands on it because they'll t because they'll they'll destroy in minutes what you took years to build he goes on he goes on to say how after he put the thing out all the all these critics were talking all the shit about what he was trying to say so he figured one book was enough and as much as as much as i like and as much as i like analysis um i do th i do think the the point in this is when people tr try and go too far and project what project what the tr what the theme is cuz sometimes the theme from a writer is, I I want to I want to write a story that people that people would be re that people would read and be entertained by. It's that simple. Yep. It goes back to the uh, the problem that a lot of people seem to have, and this is something that I know we've brought up many times on this show on this show and other shows. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have this idea that everything is political. 
Newsflash, people! It's not. I'm not even. I'm not even going with the political angle. I'm more. Go I'm more going with the idea. With the idea of tr of trying to, trying to trying to psychoanalyze the the rightist writer using tenuous um. Ten tenuous ar tenuous argumentation. All right, I'll, I'll rephrase mm -hmm. my statement because I think I I, I I had the right idea with it. I just said it wrong. The idea that everything has to have a message. That it that I'm willing to go with, especially since. If I'm being honest, um, themes-based storytelling is cancer. <laughs> because it's a theme. A theme is so, is certainly something you can fall back on, but you can't make it the core of the core of it because themes do not make a story. Um, they don't even they don't even make an Aesop fable. <laughs> I mean, yes, the yes the less the lesson in the tortoise and the hare is slow and steady wins the race, but. You can't just say, you can't just say that's the theme and be and be done with it. It's not to mention. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Finish your point, monk. I have something that I wanted to go into. Oh, uh, if you, tr whenever you, tr whenever you try and whenever you try and boil down a story to themes, what you end up, what you end up getting is a set is a set of bullet points. And I want I do want to use one I do want to use one example because I I had I had just watched it a few hours ago. I'd watched that I'd watched episode 14 of Revice. And give, given that this was a situation where where three members of the Igarashi family are now writers. Now, yeah. I don't I don't want to spoil too much, but a motif, arguably a theme that appears in that episode is Iki is that Iki actually needing to trust people instead of instead of having the Atlas complex he's had for mo for most of the time, hell, he calls himself the nosiest man in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And and actually actually trust other people to to be able to be able to carry the load and think instead of thinking that he has to bail everyone out himself, be the big brother of the family all the time. And in that scene, and that. While that is while that is certainly the while that is certainly a theme in that episode, um, it's not the it's not the only motif in in that particular story. And of course, of course, of course, there's a bunch of other a bunch of other stuff going on. And Vice being well, Vice. <laughs> Hashtag nice Vice. But the but that but the but the, uh, the but the theme the only time the theme is really. Is really hammered home is when one of the other family members, after the dad is doing one of his um, stunts to try and go viral, it is that tr is that trust can is that it takes a lot is that um, it can take a lot of courage to just trust. Mm -hmm. it, a lot more courage trust takes a lot more courage than worrying. Um, and. There, I could go. I could go a little bit further on, but I do want. I when Vice when Revice eventually finishes, I do want to do a special episode just go just going over it as a whole. It's pretty good. I love Revice. Um, but the but the point the point is is that even though there's that theme, that's not the beginning and end of that story. Uh, and you need and you need to be you need the story to tie that theme together. But what um before I'd unfortunately cut you off, what were you going what were you going to go into um uh, Zan? So I, I was gonna say that um this whole thing where uh where there is either authors stating their intentions or throwing their themes at the very front of their of their storytelling, which is why it comes across as flat and pandering. Mm -hmm. Um I think is a bit of deep-seated projection because those authors and those people tend to be the same people who use death of the author so liberally i'd rather smack them over the head with a fucking sledgehammer and cause real death of the author <laughs> I hate... no as as we learned from cody rhodes don't use a sledgehammer use the golden shovel <laughs> fair i will give you that but the the point is um, they're terrified of being misinterpreted, especially since a lot of the, and, and 
you know, I hate to generalize this way, so please understand this is a generalization and does not indicate every creator of this t of this ilk. Um, but a lot of them are terrified of being misinterpreted for their for suddenly being anti whatever or being seen and bigoted in some fashion because they run in that crowd. Um, and they're always so quick to use death of the author to castigate people at the same time. It's a bit of, of mental hypocrisy and gymnastics uh, that I see that, that tends to be one of the driving factors behind all this. No, this is, this is a story about gay persecution, how we have to help the gay people. Well, it looks pretty, pretty, uh, it, it pr look, looks pretty homophobic to me. Well, the bad guys are, are supposed to be homophobic. Oh. And it's just out there. Manga Kamen ended up bringing that up because one in in that review that I mentioned, he later on in it, he brought up he brought up a counter a counter example when it came to uh, when it came when it came to ta when it came to tackling the subject of racism, that being the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. It's a good game because your 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 because the prosec the prosecutor. Who 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 probably goes through more wine than Goto did coffee, um, has a has a very strong bias against the Japanese, and as as the story goes on, a lot I don't want to spoil too much on it, but a lot of it comes comes down to his comes down to his own trauma when a Japanese person he trusted um, was what was was found guilty of murder. Including the mur mm. including the murder of his brother. Now, now um, there's a whole lot there's a whole lot more to the story. And even a even after that, he admits that he was wrong about the about his perspective and tries to make steps to change it. That is that is a far bet that is a far better approach than ju than ju than just than just a binary. Mm -hmm. Because that because that's. Uh, for as for as ridiculous as as um as the ge as the game gets, especially especially with the living meme that is Herlock Sholmes, <laughs> who always comes to a wrong conclusion. Mm -hmm. You ha the fact of the matter is his his particular issue is handled more maturely. And let's be honest, the Ace the it's not like the Ace Attorney series has no has no experience when it comes to how people handle trauma. Hi, Goto. Let's uh, let's let's give Goto a little credit. <laughs> let's get yeah, just a, just a little, just a trite amount. Oops, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> even though even though he had the even though he had the best he had the best theme in the whole trilogy, and no one's gonna and no one's gonna argue against me on that. <laughs> Not gonna argue it for me. He had the best character theme in the yeah. whole trilogy. Yeah, I still yeah, yeah. insist that "Cornered" from the very first Ace Attorney is the best theme in the entire oh. set. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I should have clarified character theme, especially. Um, I I even ended up using it in in a very early a very early review from in my from my more cringy days as a reviewer. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you can't look back on your past and cringe, you aren't doing it right. Great, <laughs> yeah. hey, amen, brother. But I would, I would say a lot. I would say a lot of people who, who, um, who, who, at, who public, who advertise about how serious or mature their story is, they are in the same vein as the as the people who as the people who are doing game design but want to be seen as artists. I've when it can for a while for a while I entertained the. Our, is our video games art debate? As I got older, I stopped because I came because I came to realize a lot of the people who are ins who are insisting on it are doing it wrong. Now, as far as as far as whether or not I have to answer that question on, on whether or not video games are art, the answer is yes. However, trying to strive for some idea of quote unquote art will always lead to a farce. They're art, game. but they're a different kind of art. And if we want to get more uh, esoteric with that, just about anything can be art. Uh, 
depending on how it's created and and what it inspires. Mm -hmm. Trying to strive for what you think art is, is what's going to cause the farce. That's what we're getting at here. Yeah. The, the, uh, the advice I've, the advice I've always, I've always been given when I when it came to writing and the advice that I, I try and, I try and give people when it comes to GMing is, is don't, th don't think, don't think about, don't think about the high, don't think about the high minded stuff. If you want to, if you want to write a certain story, just write it. Don't write it with the in with the intention of get of getting some some degree of prestige. If you if you end up get if you end up getting it, that is a byproduct. Now, to bring this to bring this back to the to the seriousness thing, even though even I do th I do think that th that um that particular fa that particular fallacy or that particular mindset is slowly beginning to fade out. I think it I think it's because a lot I think it's because a lot of a lot of fans just re, just realize that tr that trying to trying to take themselves seriously in response to pe in response to people um turning up their noses is oh, is a f is a fight that you're never going to be able to win. Yeah. So instead of instead of trying instead of trying to convince them you should just you should just you should just mock. You should just mock them. Um, I'm reminded of a quote attributed to Mark Twain on the matter: "Never argue with idiots. They will drag you down to their level and beat you with experience." <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And when it comes to when it comes when it comes to um when it comes now when it comes to the the um, Togusat centuries that we've talked about um. It's funny that you bring that you brought up Zet earlier because it because one of the one of the motifs with it is a prime is a prime example of chasing that being a farce. I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but as I understand it, the big premise is Zet is a zero fanboy. <laughs> he is he I he idolizes Z, he idolizes uh, zero. In a sense, yeah. It starts like if you add in the mo the the movie miniseries to it to the to the storyline, he basically was someone who did idolize Zero and worked to become Zero's apprentice, his mm -hmm. successor. And they went off on a mission together and then Zet got separated. So, you're not entirely wrong there. But the the point that I'm the point that I'm getting at is that as I as I understand it, a major arc with with Zet is is um is ha is trying is having to having to understand what the what um what living up to a certain ideal actually means versus versus well, what he thought. Bear, it bear in mind, we haven't gotten very far in Zet so far. I think we're only like four or five episodes in right now. Yeah, the. The point is, is that is that from what from what I have seen of Zed, it's tr it is trying to lean into into that that degree of com of coming of age of someone who, someone going from what they think what they think is an ideal versus actually living up to it. That seems to be that seems to be the vibe that I get that I get with um, Zet. Of course. Yeah. It, of of course, it doesn't exactly doesn't exactly hurt that they got Kageyama to do the opening for the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh. incident! Incidentally, the the jacket that Kageyama had for the for the single, I want it. <laughs> oh, and when it comes to when it com the thing, the the thing. The thing that I find the thing that I find interesting with a lot of the ones that have serious leanings that we've talked about, a lot of those serious leanings come come off as a come off as a byproduct of right of writing characters to be multi layered. Um, since we since since we're both fans of since we're both fan, since all three of us are fans of Double to one extent or another, I'd say I'd say we can use when it comes to this multi layeredness. I'd say we can use one of the heroes and one of the villains for this. On the hero end, since we brought him up in the past with with all his screaming, let's bring up um, Shotaro. Oh yeah, Shotaro 
is tr is tr from day one has been trying to live up to this idea of what the of what he thought the boss was, and the and Ooh. the idea of hard boiled. But as the series goes on, both himself and us as the audience start to realize that's not what being hard boiled really is. Mm -hmm. That's just the ideal. That is the farcical ideal. And that shit actually points this out in his review of Double. Is that he's actually a lot more hard uh, he's actually a lot more hard boiled than he gives himself credit for and that the cast gives him credit for. Mm -hmm. The thing of it is is that yeah, he's not exactly super tough on the outside. He's easily flustered at times. But when it's time to put up or shut up, fucker does not the fucker is tough as steel. He doesn't let anything get to him. Mm -hmm. The only reason the terror Dobont gets to him is because he's exposed to the power over time. But if it was a if it was this first encounter, he could have easily stomped all over Ryube. Because he would not have let his power overtake him that easily. Yeah. And even then, he quickly overcame Terror's power once Philip was in danger. Mm -hmm. He has a strong inner self. Yeah. Which is which is why which is why a car, which is why Joker is a is such an appropriate Gaia memory for him. Yeah, he's a wild card. Mm -hmm. And since since we brought him up, we may we may as well go with go with on the opposite end of things, Ryube Sonozaki, aka Japanese Elton John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with Ryube. He was a he comes off as like a mob boss throughout most of the series. I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of the whole lay motif of the Sonozaki family. Is they're a crime family, mm -hmm. essentially. But when you actually sit back and when you actually take away his power, it becomes clear that he's actually a very fragile human being. That the death of uh, the, the, the the death of Raito, it broke him. Mm -hmm. hard and he is a shell of what he used to be and that's something that you kind of see more and more of over time and once once we get to the the final arc well the final arc with the Sonozakis not counting the uh, Utopia arc mm -hmm. that sh that shell that that illusion he has post pasted up of this unstoppable crime boss it shatters and once you see the frail man underneath, even even Terra's power can no longer make Shotaro afraid of him. Mm -hmm. It's like, how am I supposed to be afraid of that? I think it's. A, I think the other thing that's also very t also very telling was is the fact that you would th you would think that him that him meeting his end would be a triumphant moment, and yet it's portrayed almost like a tragedy. What with it? What with him? What with him dancing as him dancing as as if he was at a ball, while while the Sonozaki estate burns around him. It, it's a case of the evil of the terror Dopon itself is gone, mm -hmm. but all now without that power, all that's left is the broken man, a man so mentally broken that he can't even realize that he doesn't even see what's going on around him. He's so lost in his delusion that he doesn't see the fires burning him alive. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, I'd be I'd be remiss of the fact of the fact that I admit that Raito's death basically bro basically broke the whole family in one in one regard or another. Since oh yeah, um, on one hand, Raito was the was the only person who cal who calmed who was able to be a calming presence for the t for the sisters. In one in one form or an, in one form or another, and there was the and there was what happened when the when the wife in the family, um, was so, was so con was so consumed with revenge that she that she was willing to, she that she was willing to use her own son as a, as a pawn in that. Yeah, that's what makes the series work. Is just so like. Everyone, all of the characters, every villains and heroes alike, are so multi-layered. There's so much going on with all of them that that maturity that we were talking about 
it just comes out naturally because of just how multi-layered every single character is and how much depth you have yep. to dig through to find the real character underneath. Mm -hmm. Now, even even with even with characters that were, now, even with characters that did that didn't last long, like like Kirihiko, as as much of as as much of a villain as he as he may have been since he was since he was distributing um Gaia memories and and making dopants he he views he views himself as a as essentially a patriot for Futo yeah he he loves the city in fact he helped design their mascot mm -hmm. and he was only doing this cuz he thought that you know Gaia memories were going to be the future of evolution, would lead them to a new age. So he thought everything he was doing was for the betterment of Futo. It wasn't until he realized just how dark and devious the Sonozaki family could get, especially Saiko, that he realized, oh god, I've been working for villains this whole time. Shit. Oh. And now if, if I want if I have to use an example outside of Tokusatsu. Just to just to help further illustrate this theme, I want to I want to bring up well my favorite iteration of Star Trek, and that is the, that is of course Deep Space Nine. <laughs> now, as much as I enjoy making the Cisco is a badass jokes and the and the fact that um and lo local black man punches everybody, um, <laughs> there are a, there are a lot of there are a lot of layers to a to a character like Benjamin Cisco. He ha obviously he has the, he has of course the baggage in the in the fact that um, he ha that he's had to put up with Picard when when and when anytime he's anytime he's in the same room all he sees is someone who was inadvertently responsible for the death of his wife and even though even though bo even though both have tried to move past that some things never fully heal. And anytime the two of them are in the same room, you can just see him staring daggers at him. <laughs> um, but there's there's also there's also the fact that he has there's also the fact of him being a, a trying to be a balance being a soldier as well as being a fa well as being a father figure to his son, as well as as well as the um, awkward position that he's put in as a essentially a political figure. In a, in a place that he shouldn't be because of the way the prime directive is supposed to work. Yeah, and on top of all of that, there's also uh, those the entity in the wormhole basically choosing him for some kind of big task. Yeah. So he's he's getting it on all fronts. In it in with and with all of that, him being a ver him being the most passionate of the of the leader archetype characters throughout the fr throughout the franchise. It's the, it's that pa it is that passion that's that's what leads to his particular outbursts. Um, yeah. I'd say I'd say a, I'd say a good a um. I the example I always I always bring up is the episode in the pale moonlight, which one in any normal circumstance would be a st would be a heroic story of how he saved the Federation, and in reality. The way the story is structured, he may as he may as well be confessing his sins in a church. Because because he because he goes into he because he is basically going into detail on all the things that violate everything that he stood for, that he had to that he had to do. The goal the goal was worth it, but but the but the price may not have been, is the is the key thing with it. And even th even though he says, "If I had to do it all over again, I would have," there is a bit the way he says it. There's a bit of a question of, "Do you, do you really believe that, or are you trying to are you trying to tell yourself that?" And again, in both of these cases, they're not try they're not trying to boast about them about being mature. It just comes because they're, because they're do because they're doing stories that are tackling mature themes. And 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 mature and mature, sto and mature story angles and letting the and letting the audience go with it as they see fit. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I suppose a I suppose a side example of this kind of thing is, 
and sh and shades you've seen this as much as i have of story of stories that of of why um why the it's meant for kids argument always falls flat on its face yeah it, it's it is the exact opposite problem that that we've been dealing with tonight is that saying that oh you, you know we don't have to be you know we don't have to have any maturity we don't have to be, take ourselves seriously at all we're doing something for kids one of the writers of one of the writers of a certain Doctor Who episode tried to pull this argument and got roasted. Yep. In a, and because it, go ahead. Sorry, it, it, the thing of it is, I almost lost my train of thought there. This argument basically is it, that is it's not even so much an argument; it's an excuse. It is. It is absolutely an excuse. It is simply saying. Well, I didn't want to write a, a, a mature, thought-provoking thought story. I just wanted to write bullshit. I just wanted to come up with an, a quick, easy cash grab. So I'm just going to say it's made for kids. Mm -hmm. Well, We see right through it. <laughs> that and the fact that, again, going back to the whole authors announcing a thing rather than just letting the, the uh, work speak for itself. Um, in the end... As with all of the good examples that we've put forward here, the work will find its demographic and find the people interested without anyone having to say what it's about. Um, yeah. So true, true works that are meant for younger audiences, find those younger audiences simply because it appeals to the younger audience more than it does an older audience. Mm -hmm. And the same can be said for any other set of demographics. Uh, that doesn't mean that other audiences outside that primary demographic won't like it. There are plenty of children's shows, for lack of a better word, that people our age still enjoy to this day. But yeah. we don't need to announce it. It doesn't need to be put front and center as a as a a banner. You know. Yeah. There are times there are times where I wonder if um if the fan base if the fan base announcing to the high heavens about how about how quote unquote mature um stories stories like um Adventure Time or Steven Universe were got were part of the reason why they ended up having such massive seasonal rot and declines. Mm. Might course, have been a small contributing factor. <laughs> I'm not saying it was the contributing factor, especially when it comes to Steven Universe. So, I, I have I have no in, I have no intention of do, of of roasting it largely because, big, largely because um, other channels have done it in a far more thorough way than I can. Especially, yeah. Say, especially like say misanthropony. Uh huh. But, uh, I I would say that that's maybe a small contributing factor. The primary contributing factors tend to be. Um, I guess what I would call uh, pedestal syndrome. Hubris? I mean, it is it is a form of hubris. Uh, not only does the work get major claims, but because of the... Specifically, a, like one set of the creation is so highly lauded, usually writing, that those writers suddenly believe they can do no wrong. Mm-hmm. And then you get, well, shit writing. Oh, there's definitely examples of that, no doubt. Yeah. I'd s when you when you mentioned pedestal, all I could think of is I'm Vince Russo. I created the Attitude Era. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's a definitely a good one. You're not wrong, Monk. You are not wrong. Nope. Because you de you definitely ha you definitely have that with him of th or or a lot of other people thinking that because they did because they did this one thing a long time ago that it that it means that their sh it means that their shit won't stink. Um. Also, no also known as also known as um Cowboys fans, but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> but if if there's if there's any if there's any bit of advice that that when it comes to this, the obvious the obvious question that that could be a, that is going to be asked is, then how then how do you write then how do you write a a serious story? I think the answer to this is quite simple: you write a story. 
don't, don't fo focus on whether or not it's serious or funny or what. Just write the story that you feel is best. The rest will come. Mm -hmm. Especially, especially since the best story, the best stories that we've talked about, always ha always have a mix of things. Um, it, the reason, I'll you instead of using something obvious, I'll use um, I'll use a case like Avatar for an, for an example with this, to kind to kind of to kind of illustrate what happens when you have a sh the difference between say elements. And making that the focus. We brought this up in the when we did the reconstruction regarding Korra, but consider the characters of Sokka and Bolin. Sokka was never written to be the comic relief character; it just happened. And it, and comic relief wasn't the be all end all of him. He was the smart guy of the group. Because he, he, he had to be by necessity, yeah. he was the only non-bender. Uh, that not only ended up with him being the butt monkey of a couple jokes involving bending, because he had no way to really stop it when it was used against him in a joking way, and in, in many ways he stopped it used against him in an actual serious way by simply running or finding a proper defense. Mm -hmm. um, but because he didn't have the same tool set everybody else did. He started at a lower rung on the ladder when it came to uh, natural weapons, essentially. Uh, he had to come up with ways to be smarter and a faster thinker, too. He had to think smarter and think about those smart things faster mm -hmm. in order to retain... I don't want to say effectiveness. Retain... Im What's the word I'm looking for here? He he needed to do all that to be at least on a somewhat similar level as the of all the benders he hangs out with. Mm. Yeah, he had to be to to be to pull himself equal action wise because he was always their equal socially. They were all friends, but to pull himself to a level of equality that he and this wasn't even like a level of equality they would have demanded from him. It was a level of equality that they assumed. They assumed that he you know. He was just as good as they were in whatever he was doing. Th their assumption was, it's Sokka. He's good. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to prove himself to us. But to prove himself to himself and put himself at the same level of effort, I think that's the best way, the same level of effort as everyone else. Yes. He, he had to be that smart guy. Mm -hmm. And yes, it resulted in him being very funny as well. Because sometimes a good group needs a comedic linchpin to hold everything together. Um, at the same, at the now contrast that with Bolin, who, as we mentioned in the reconstruction, was designed to be the comic relief, and nothing but. Mm -hmm. And because of, because of the fact that he, because of the fact that he's meant to be the comic relief, um, any sort any sort of story, and anytime you want to do anything with him. The comic relief comes comes screeching comes screeching in and saying no yet you, you he's the comic relief you have to you have to do this. Want to try and put him in a uh, power struggle romance with with the princess of a water tribe? Nope, he suddenly her doggy. Mm -hmm. Because and, that's funny, right? Or why the, aren't you laughing? <laughs> yeah, and the, I I on I do on I do honestly think that 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 more people. Who want who want to insert comedy into their writing should really spend some time watching people do stand up. Simply, be, simply because of the fact that a lot of pe a lot of people who quote unquote insert comedy into their writing don't quite seem to understand the importance of comedic timing. Yeah. Or j or just simple setup and pay and payoff with a with a given joke. And if the it, if... oldest joke of all. Comedy is just tragedy plus time. And if if that's if that's if that doesn't work for you, then I'll then I'll use one other example. Go wa go watch all of all of the old all of the old um all the old shorts that Tex Avery and Chuck Jones did in their life. Oh Jesus! Is it low hanging fruit to bring to bring up Looney Tunes in this regard? Yes. But you're also getting you're also getting a lot of comedic timing incidents in a very distilled fashion. Grant, 
a very exaggerated fashion, don't get me wrong, but a very distilled one. And especially when it comes to Tex Avery, I can't I can't I can't stress enough how influential he is when it comes to animation. But when it but when trying when trying to write a serious story or a com or a comedic story or anything like that the key th the key thing you should the key thing you should be thinking about instead of instead of what the theme is is what the sto uh, what the story is supposed to be entailing what the characters are what the wor what the world is taking place in is even if it just happens to be our world with just with a f just with extra steps these are th these are things that you have to think about and i think that's I think that's the reason why you're seeing a whole lot of authors and a whole lot of um, critique focusing so much on world building in the last few years. You have to build a believable world to tell believable stories. Yes. There has to be some verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. Even if that world is not described to some of the ridiculous detail we get in things like, uh, like the Wheel of Time... Um, there, there is still an amount of world building that must be done for the stage that you are having everything happening in to seem real. Mm -hmm. It's not just about describing the landscape. It's about giving us an idea of the kind of people that live there, about the kind of things that happen in this in their, in this particular zone, in the area that you're talking about, what, what kind of events they have to deal with, what kind of history have they had that might be relevant to the story. You have to give us all that so we can paint a picture in our minds as to what we're, crea what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And when it comes... When it comes to getting bringing this all the way back to the ser to the seriousness fallacy, I think if I think if there's any takeaway is the fact that whoever that the people who the people who want more serious stories, it are going are going to be are going to be people who are afraid of their own shadows, inevitably. Because the people who actually just want good stories, don't care about how serious it is. And that that's why as as overused as that C.S. Lewis quote is, and I do find C.S. Lewis to be overrated on many things, it is still going to hold water because because of the fact that in in trying to be serious, you end up being childish. And I think I think that's as good as any of a um, coda to put to leave off on. Um, Next week will not be as as high and mighty about 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 writing theory as th as this week was. We'll be doing something a little bit more tongue in cheek, or rather tongue through cheek, involving a certain <laughs> st involving a certain studio that I have wanted to roast on an open fire for years. I'm probably not going to make any new friends with this, but when has that stopped me? I'll just sum it up in uh, three words here, ladies and gentlemen. Round one, fight. So, keep a close eye out for that. I do have a few interviews I'm going to be doing, including, um, it'll be it'll be up later this week. But unless 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 he ends up being late and gay, Doku and I will be doing will be doing a bit of therapy because he ended up suffering through High Guardian Spice. He has my condolences. I A K A the. The cartoon's so bad, nobody wants to pirate it. <laughs> Pirating High Guardian Spice? No, thank you. And because of the fact that he that he was ranting about it, I figured we sh we should I should do a, I should play the role of a shrink or even the role of a priest, and and just let him get <laughs> just let him get it out of his system. Um, probably gonna have to do this again down down the road. But I'll get I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. And of and of course on Friday, as there will be there will be more of he more of heavens and heresies and more and and get the stopwatch ready for how long it takes before Xanatrix says what the fuck. <laughs> you know, actually, I come to think about it, uh, Monk, I didn't say it last episode. You didn't, but to be fair, there wasn't anything that was all that egregious to it. It oh was... yeah, we're going into spells this time. Yeah, so there's a <laughs> higher likelihood of it, especially when we go back and consider all the secondary spell effects. Yep. <sighs> but that is a, 
that is a story for another for another time. In the meantime, and un so until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.